Good morning everybody, welcome to our morning service on this the first Sunday after Trinity. It's lovely to have you with us. I hope you don't mind me saying, but because of the bank holiday and other time constraints, this morning service is something of a Thorpe family production, but I hope you don't mind that. Let's just quiet our hearts for a moment, and then we'll begin. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. And so we say together our introductory prayer. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. And so now we're going to sing together our first hymn, uh, be on your screens, it's Jesus the name, high over all.
So now we come to our time of confession. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And so we say together, Almighty God, a heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we continue with a special prayer of thanksgiving appropriate for the Trinity season. Blessed are you, sovereign God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time, you made us in your image, and in these last days, you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts. Your Spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. And now Jonathan Thorpe is going to lead us in our reading. This reading is from Mark 3, verses 20 to 35. Jesus and Beelzebub. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by the Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. I tell you the truth, all the sins and blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is a guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an evil spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my brother, mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my mother, brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing us together and we ask all that by the power of your Holy Spirit and through your good grace, you'll speak to us now. In Jesus' name, Amen. Last week, we were looking at John's Gospel, chapter 3, 
and we, we were considering the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus, a highly respected rabbi, and the one who Jesus described as Israel's teacher. Well, this morning we're shifting over to Mark's Gospel, but also chapter 3. And although these two passages aren't really connected, we can see that there is also here the beginnings of a controversy, and the start of a clash uh, will slowly develop between Jesus and the religious authorities. The other thing that we need to remember and appreciate is that this is is that this, at this point of the gospel, it's still early days, for we are right at the start of Jesus' ministry. And yet, from the moment of Jesus' baptism and the calling of his disciples, we can see that Jesus is swiftly gaining an incredible reputation for his teaching, and especially for his miracles of healing. For by the time we get to this point, Jesus has already freed a man, possessed by an evil spirit in Capernaum, healed Simon's mother-in-law who had been in bed with a fever, healed many who had various diseases and driven out many demons, healed a man of leprosy, healed a paralyzed man. You may remember him. He was the one whose friends lowered him through the roof on a mat and healed a man with a shriveled hand. So as you can see, his fame was clearly growing as large crowds started to follow him, just as we can see in this passage from Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the lake, and a large crowd from Galilee followed. When they heard all he was doing, many people came to him from Judea, Jerusalem, Idumea, and the regions across the Jordan, and around Tyre and Sidon. Because of the crowd, he told his disciples to have a small boat ready for him to keep the people from crowding him, for he had healed many, so that those with diseases were pushing forward to touch him. Whenever the evil spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. So as you can see, by the time we get to our passage, our passage for today, we're not totally dis surprised to discover that when Jesus entered a house, again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. Imagine that. And it's at this point that things start to go downhill, for as we find out in, John, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 21, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. You can hear the frustration in their voices, can't you? What on earth is Jesus doing? Doesn't he know that he's upsetting the religious authorities? Things are getting out of hand. Things are getting out of control. Doesn't he know that things are getting serious and that he's courting opposition? He's becoming obsessed with all this healing malarkey, so much so that he's got no time for his family or his friends. And he can't even feed himself. He must be out of his mind. Well, there may be a bit of poetic license there, but I'm sure you get my point. Now, it's interesting because in Hebrew thought, when somebody is said to be mad or out of their mind, it has the connotation of being beside oneself, literally standing next door to yourself. In other words, out of your mind. But the point is that the subtext in this passage is that the teachers of the law, the ones who have come down from Jerusalem, who we've already been told earlier in Mark, are beginning to plot how they might kill Jesus, are also somewhat out of their mind and beside themselves. But this time, out of anger. Mark chapter 3, 22 and following, we have this. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. And so now these teachers of law have really lost control. And they've ratcheted things up to a brand new level. For no longer are we debating if Jesus is simply mad or out of his mind. He's now been accused of something much worse. He is being accused of being an instrument of Satan, possessed by Beelzebub, the lord of the flies. In other words, the devil. And so in today's parlance, what we have here is a biblical example of a conspiracy theory. 
For just as today there are many who are trying, possibly for their own ends, to convince people not to be vaccinated against the coronavirus and cast doubt over the whole vaccination program and even the disease itself, so the teachers of the law, who don't like what Jesus is doing, have come up with a trumped-up charge designed to deceive the faithful and detract from Jesus' ministry. And it's plainly ridiculous, as Jesus goes on to point out. Mark 3 verses 23 and following. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. But it is Jesus' second little parable, which is perhaps the most telling, when he says in Mark chapter 3 verse 27, in fact, no one can enter a strong man's house and carry off his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can rob his house. This neatly ties in with the words of John the Baptist, who previously declared that after me will come one more powerful than I, the thongs of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. For you see, Jesus is the one, the one who has the authority, the strength and the power to overcome the strong man and to rob his house. For far from being an instrument of Satan, Jesus is the one who can snatch people from Satan's grasp. Now, this is a serious conversation. For these teachers of the law, these teachers of biblical truth, have accused Jesus of acting in the interests of Satan, a blasphemous act in their mind. But it's actually they who have blasphemed by not recognizing the, mir the miraculous signs and the good that Jesus was doing in the sight of God. Jesus tells them in Mark 3, 28 and following, I tell you the truth, says Jesus, all the sins and blasph blasphemies of men will be forgiven them, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an evil spirit. For as Bishop Tom Wright in his small commentary on this passage points out, his critics have painted themselves now into something of a corner because once you label what is in fact the work of the Holy Spirit as the work of the devil, there is no way back. It's like holding a conspiracy theory. All the evidence you see will simply confirm your belief. You will be blind to the truth. It isn't that God gets specially angry with one sin in particular. It's rather that if you decide firmly that the doctor who is offering to perform a life-saving operation on you is in fact a sadistic murderer, you will never give your consent to the operation. And the truth is that there are many people in our world today who have their own pet theories and philosophies, many of which are simply a copy of what is in vogue at the time, and despite having some of the brightest and the best at our universities, the modern trend for much of our society is to either simply go with the flow or cancel and shut down anybody that you disagree, disagree with. It seems that in many quarters we have lost the art of discussion and critical thinking. And sadly, sometimes those who have a Christian faith find themselves at the blunt end of these events, which can be very hard indeed. And it's particularly hard when those moments of conflict take place within your own family. Which leads us on neatly to the final part of our passage in Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? He asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him. He said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Now we know that Jesus loved his mother. So this episode seems a slightly strange one, being one of the few where Jesus seems to be slightly at odds with his family and particularly his mother. And to be honest, in a day and age when we are so used to our children going off to university and people working far away from where they grew up, its impact upon us may be slightly lost. But then we need to remember that in Jesus' day, 
as it still is in much of the Middle East, family ties are extremely important, often with many generations living together in the same house, looking after, caring for and providing for one another. So when Jesus appears to be questioning his family by asking, who are my mother and my brothers? It's very shocking. But of course, Jesus was using this moment as a teaching opportunity, because in a sense, part of what Jesus was doing was building a new family, as much as he, as he was building a new kingdom, the kingdom of God. And his members would be not only those who recognized Jesus to be the long-awaited Messiah, putting their faith and their trust in him, but those who lived their lives in the light of it, serving the Lord and doing his will. Now, as I've already mentioned, there may be times when we face all sorts of opposition because of, our, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, certainly in society at large, and perhaps in the church itself, and perhaps most painfully within our own families. In such moments, let us do all that we can to build our faith and our trust in God, the Lord Jesus Christ and his word, praying and trusting that God will hear our prayers and through his spirit bless, guide and direct our actions so that together we might all grow in our faith and bring glory to his name. In the name of Christ, amen. And so now we're going to have our second hymn. It's a lovely hymn. It's called, I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say. And so now we're going to declare our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. And so we say together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May Almighty God strengthen this faith in us. So now we have our special prayer, our colic prayer, for the first Sunday after Trinity. O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers. And because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace, that in the keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now Ruth Thorpe is going to lead us in our prayers and intercessions and she'll conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer. As members of God's family, let us pray together to our Heavenly Father. As members of the Church of God, May we show his likeness by doing his will. May those visiting our churches find God's beauty and truth, open-hearted loving and unity of purpose. May they hear God's word and understand it so that their lives are transformed by coming to faith in you. Father, let your will be done. As members of the human race, may we work together to share resources and love our neighbour. Especially we pray for a better sharing of COVID vaccines and continued support for the poor with aid supplies. May we respect and learn from one another. Father, let your will be done. Father God, there is such turmoil in the world, heightened during this pandemic. May the leaders of all nations act justly as they govern and be brought to account where they fall short. We remember nations where oppression is particularly obvious. Myanmar, Yemen, Gaza, Mali, Northern Nigeria, Belarus, China, Hong Kong, and many others. Amongst the turmoil, may leaders learn to inspire and those with vision be valued and heard. Father, let your will be done. Help us as we continue to support those in our communities. Many feel isolated lonely and fed up with the restrictions we have been living under. Others feel anxiety or a loss of confidence about going out and about again. We pray for understanding and sensitivity for all those feeling these pressures. We remember too those in our communities and our own families who do not know the depth of your love for them. May they see Christ in us. Father, let your will be done. We pray now for all who come to Jesus in need. May they find in him forgiveness, healing and wholeness of body, mind and spirit, strength to cope with their difficulties and a constant inner renewing we pause to silently lift before the Lord those known to us who are sick or suffering, asking for his comfort for them. Father, let your will be done. We are mindful of those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. The pain of loss is so acute. 
We pray for them to turn to you in their need and find comfort. Along with those recently bereaved, we continue to remember those known to us who have died during the pandemic, whether from COVID or other reasons. Separation from family and friends has made grieving especially difficult to cope with. Please bless and uphold them in their continuing pain as we give thanks for the life and faith of those who have died. Father, let your will be done. Lord, we marvel at the generosity of your love and your acceptance of us. May we grow closer to your likeness in our daily lives. And we draw together our prayers now by joining in saying that prayer which Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And so now we come to our final hymn for our service this morning. It's a great him to finish with on this first Sunday after Trinity. It is Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Now we come to our closing prayer and blessing. Eternal God, 
Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Lord of the past, the present, and the future, open our eyes to your presence, our hearts to your love, and our lives to your purpose. In the name of Christ. Amen. And we say together the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. So now we come to our blessing. May the Lord bless you and watch over you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look kindly on you and give you peace. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, thank you so much. That brings our service to a close for another week. It's been lovely to have you with us. Um, please look out for our link on YouTube because there will be a service online next week. But there will also be a service in church at Necton Parish Church at 10 o'clock in the morning, a service of morning worship, and a service of morning worship at North Pickenham Parish Church at quarter past 11. Necton at 10, North Pickenham at quarter past 11. Uh, but, so that's it. Look forward to seeing you next week. Take care of yourselves, look after one another. Goodbye, God bless, and we'll see you then. If you would like to support the ministry of any of the churches within the Necton Benefice, then please see the notes under this service on the YouTube channel for All Saints Necton. Or you can now give to each of the churches by using the QR codes which follow. Just pause the video at the code of your choice, scan it using the appropriate app on your phone, and you'll be taken directly to the diocesan donation page for that particular church. God bless and thank you for your support.